Jeep's Compass now makes more sense as a credible mid-sized SUV alternative. This contender has been brought up to date and there's now e-hybrid tech as well as a flagship plug-in PHEV option. Time to start taking this car a bit more seriously. We all know what a real Jeep looks like, rough, tough and wilderness ready. You might though be less acquainted with the models this growing brand wants to sell to ordinary family SUV buyers. Cars like this one, the Compass, aimed directly at the buoyant mid-sized Qashqai segment. This MP552 series model was first launched back in late 2017, but four years on it was facelifted and its engines heavily electrified to create the car we're going to look at here, which features both hybrid and, as in this case, plug-in hybrid tech. Electrification will, of course, be the overriding theme in future Jeep models. The company's already shown us how its first full EV will look. For now, though, the brand still needs to sell with fossil fuel in the SUV market's core C segment, a class the brand has unsuccessfully been trying to crack for years. Starting back in 2007 with the very first generation MK49 series Compass model, which somehow sold for eight years. A poorly conceived ugly duckling that even Jeep now wants to forget. This current design, as we said earlier, arrived in 2017, aiming to capitalise on the success of the smaller Renegade model that had been launched a couple of years before. But it lacked its smaller stablemate's sassy charm, seemed dated inside, used a selection of inefficient engines and seemed clunky to drive. Ideally, a completely new generation Compass model would have followed on by now, but with all the brand's resources devoted to future EVs, there wasn't scope for that. So what we've got instead is this, a version of this MP552 series design, so heavily updated that you might as well call it new. We mentioned the powertrain lineup, which also includes a conventional 1.3 litre petrol unit. Well, the interior has also taken a huge step forward and the car's had a visual wash and brush up. Is it all enough to give Jeep a genuine contender in the Qashqai class? Well, you'll need the industry's most comprehensive review, the car and driving road test, to find out. So, does this rejuvenated Compass model signal a new direction for Jeep? Just as importantly, would loyal buyers want it to? The trend amongst mainstream makers today is to produce SUVs that drive like family hatchbacks. Jeep can't wholeheartedly follow that, not if it wants to retain any brand credibility anyway. If you buy one of this American Marks products, even one as lifestyle orientated as this, then at the wheel you'll want, at least to some extent, to feel like you're in a proper SUV. Hopefully though, in this case, one with some of the rough edges smoothed away. By and large, that's pretty much what you get here. But if your benchmark is something like a Qashqai or an Attica, then you'll notice quite a few differences. Some of these are positive things, particularly the higher, more commanding driving position. Other aspects of Jeep motoring may not be quite as welcome. The engines on offer lack a little in terms of ultimate refinement, and you're obviously not going to get the cornering agility that a mere hatchback-derived crossover is going to get you. But then that kind of car doesn't need to form the basis for what Jeep calls trail-rated design. The top Trailhawk variant of this Compass we're trying here qualifies for that kind of wilderness 4x4 status. And though the lesser versions that almost all Compass customers will choose are far less capable, they'll still seem eminently credible on the kind of light forest trail you'd possibly feel rather silly driving over in most segment rivals. The thing is, though, your typical motoring will, of course, hardly ever take place on light forest trails, which is why this second-generation Compass has, since its original launch, used a more tarmac-orientated, small, wide architecture, Fiat-derived platform that, on the smaller Renegade model, proved that a Jeep really can make a credible crossover product. The real story, though, with the rejuvenated version of the second-generation Compass model we're trying here, lies with electrification. 
Most competing brands in this sector now offer a plug-in hybrid at the top of the lineup, as Jeep now does, and we're trying one here. Further down the range, though, contenders in this class tend to be divided as to whether more affordable models should offer mild hybrid tech, affordable but rather ineffective, or a self-charging full hybrid Prius-like engine, which is pricier but better able to provide the kind of economy that owners used to get from the diesel units the brand has now abandoned. In a stroke of shared Stellantis Group engineering innovation, Jeep's decided to try and provide the best of both with the one and a half litre turbocharged e-hybrid petrol engine that it expects most Compass customers to want going forward. In reality, it's probably best to view the e-hybrid powertrain as a mild hybrid package with a few extra tricks up its sleeve. The fact that it's based around a belt starter generator which drives the engine stop-start system suggests that, as does the fairly unremarkable set of overall efficiency stats. These might make you wonder whether it's really worth paying the extra for this 130 horsepower four-cylinder e-hybrid engine rather than the more affordable, unelectrified 1.3-litre conventional unit that props up the range with exactly the same output and cylinder count. That base power plant is lighter and comes with a six-speed manual transmission, so doesn't have to lug around the seven-speed dual-clutch auto gearbox that's conditional with the e-hybrid. Nevertheless, Jeep wants to convince you that an e-hybrid compass is the route you should take. And there's certainly enough cleverness with the technology on offer to suggest that its benefits ought to be great. Evidence that it wasn't primarily developed for Jeeps lies in the situation of the e-hybrid system's 19 horsepower electric motor in the gearbox rather than on the rear axle where it usually would be with a hybrid. That means there's no scope for an all-wheel drive Compass e-hybrid model. But at least there is an electric motor, which means that unlike with an ordinary mild hybrid engine, this one can drive the car on electric power alone. Though because the 48 volt battery that's being charged is tiny, just 0.8 kilowatt hours in size, only at very slow speeds and only for a few hundred yards. It actually does so in lots of ways and Jeep's decided to give names for all of them. Silent start is when you prod the start button and the car springs into life, but the engine doesn't. E-launch is where the electric motor pushes you off for the first few metres before the engine quickly springs in to help. E-creeping uses electric power where a conventional petrol auto would creep forward on tickover. E-queuing will keep you battery powered in stop-start heavy traffic. And E-parking will use electric power at parking speeds. If there's any battery charge still left over after all of this by the time you get to the open road, E-boosting will use it to help acceleration. And to help recharge said battery, recuperated energy is reclaimed when you brake. You can probably guess what that's called. E-braking. It seems like an awful lot of effort to go for the creation of something that at the end of the day isn't quite as good as the kind of self-charging full hybrid engine we've now had on cars of this size for the last two decades. It does, though, make the Compass e-hybrid feel like the proper hybrid it's pretending to be when setting off, manoeuvring and inching along in traffic queues, all of which is accomplished in impressive EV silence. Away from walking pace, though, the slightest flex of your right foot introduces the 130 horsepower engine, and not always very subtly. And the electronics can sometimes get themselves a little confused as to whether fossil fuel or battery propulsion is required for any given command. For example, the need for a quick burst of acceleration to nip into a gap in the traffic, leading to a delay in response. The dual clutch gearbox is smooth but not responsive enough to ever make the car feel in any way rapid. Officially, the rest of 62 time is 10 seconds about the same as you'd get from the unelectrified base 1.3 litre six-speed manual model. Ultimately though, if you want a compass that's really able to deliver meaningful running cost savings, you're going to need to find the substantial extra amount the brand wants for the 4xe plug-in hybrid technology we're trying here. Technology that's also conditional, if not unreasonably, 
you feel a Jeep isn't really a Jeep if it doesn't have four-wheel drive. This, mind you, isn't the kind of proper mechanical four-wheel drive system brand enthusiasts would recognise. There's nothing mechanical about it. Instead, a 180 horsepower version of the conventional 1.3 litre petrol engine we mentioned earlier drives the front wheels, aided only when necessary by a 60 horsepower electric motor mounted on the rear axle and powered by an 11.4 kilowatt hour battery pack with a WLTP rated driving range when fully charged of 30 miles. Total system output is a useful 240 horsepower, hence the theoretically rapid 7.3 second rest to 62 mile an hour time, though in practice the car never actually feels anything like that fast, hindered by a lack of low speed torque and the somewhat lethargic responses of the six speed auto gearbox you have to have. This is one of those transmissions that flares the revs wildly as soon as you ask it to do anything out of the ordinary, so you quickly learn gentle applications of your right foot and with that approach the 4xe feels quite a pleasant companion in day-to-day -day suburban duties. You'll need to learn how to use it of course and that means mastery over these three powertrain buttons on the centre stack. Hybrid is what you'll be using mostly which leaves the software to decide the propulsional balance of the engine and battery, something you can monitor via a selectable power flow screen in the e-hybrid menu on the centre screen. Alternatively, electric keeps you fully battery powered for town work and e-save preserves battery charge for urban driving you might need to do later in your journey. More modes lie next to the gear stick but these are select terrain settings for more arduous use of the E four wheel drive system, the sort of thing you simply wouldn't get with this model's more lifestyle orientated C segment plug in SUV rivals. This trail rated Trailhawk version gets five such modes including a variant specific rock setting. Your other four select terrain choices are snow and a sand and mud option plus there's sport for tarmac work and also if you simply want to leave the system to set itself up based on tractional needs. All of this gives the Compass the potential for a level of off-road prowess simply unheard of in this fashion orientated segment. Helped by the way that the rear motor allows for independent torque split over the rear axle, allowing torque to be very precisely split between the rear wheels in tricky situations. Those wheels get more articulation and travel than would usually be the case from a car of this class. Plus this Trailhawk variant gets off-road suspension, more knobbly tyres and a built-in hill descent control feature to ease you down slippery slopes. All of this, along with restyled bumpers, will allow you to attack really testing terrain thanks to a benchmark set of off-road angles and figures. An approach angle of 30.4 degrees, a departure angle of 33.3, a breakover angle of 20.9 and ground clearance of 213 millimetres, which to give you some perspective is a huge 25 millimetres more than something like a Qashqai. It's all very impressive but ultimately somewhat irrelevant in terms of the more affordable, modestly powered Compass models that the majority of customers will choose. And here lies the problem. It's very hard to take a car that's so potentially capable off-road and create from it a range of more tarmac orientated versions that can ride and handle as well as less rugged rivals on a paved surface. Jeep has certainly tried hard to achieve that, something aided by the underpinnings that this car shares with its Stellantis Group cousin, the Fiat 500X. To some extent, those efforts have borne fruit, but ultimately, you're never allowed to forget that this is more of a proper SUV. At the wheel of this car, there's no fake Qashqai genre pretense of ruggedness. Instead, you know you're in a Jeep, not only because of the shape and the design, but because of the capable, solid feel that's delivered as you drive. Is that exactly as it should be? Plenty of loyal buyers will think so. Cars of this kind used to be called crossovers. Then we got told to call them SUVs. 
it's a designation that sits a touch incongruously with some other fickle fashion-led contenders in this class. But this Jeep does, in every sense, look like a proper modern compact SUV rather than the kind of hatchback on steroids that most of the magazine experts will tell you to buy in this segment. Visually, not much has fundamentally changed about the second-generation Compass design in this updated form, but the car has gained a more modern, purposeful look that should fit in much better down at the gym. It still doesn't have the extrovert demeanour of the company's smaller Renegade model, Jeep's aware that customers here in the next class up are a touch more conservative, but there's still a splash of self-confident design here. Apparently, a Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird stealth reconnaissance aircraft was one of the styling inspirations. No, we can't see it either. Of course, reminders of brand heritage are never very far away. The most obvious reference in this regard lying with an updated three-dimensional version of the brand's traditional seven-slot front grille. Or at least what looks like a seven-slot front grille. Actually, a touch disappointingly, it's a plastic moulded panel with no cooling functionality whatsoever. That's taken care of by this now wider intake further down. These headlamps have been subtly changed too, being now of the full LED variety with twice the brilliance of the previous Zenon units, plus they incorporate built-in daytime running lights. In addition, the fog lamps have been repositioned and the lower skid plate has been made a touch more prominent. Move to the side and once more you're confronted by a mix of tradition and trendiness. The squared-off wheel arches reference every Jeep made since the Second World War, a flourish curiously juxtaposed with this swept-back windscreen angle and the tapering rear roof line with its black roof rails. Five ridges give a purposeful look to the roof, which as an option can be contrast-coloured. A couple of mid-level creases attempt to give the flanks some shape and those black plastic-clad arches house wheels that are usually either 18 or 19 inches in size, though this Trailhawk version gets these bespoke 17-inch rims. The rear end is more segment generic, but like the front, continues the purposeful SUV styling emphasis. Again, quite refreshingly, you're left in little doubt that this is a credible and potentially capable class contender, rather than a family hatch on growth hormones. Take this properly chunky towing eye, for instance. These slim tail lamps feature full LED technology and the central Jeep badge gets blue tinging to recognise this updated model's move towards electrification. Of course, as usual, what's more important is the stuff you can't see. In this case, a lengthened version of the small wide architecture Fiat-derived platform also used in the smaller Renegade and in that model's close cousin, the Fiat 500X. It's a notably stiff structure, more than 65% of which is fashioned from high-strength steel. The major part of this updated model's design budget, though, was spent inside the car. Let's take a look. It can't have been easy to take the original Mark II Compass model's fairly unmemorable cabin and, without changing the basic architecture, make it, according to the brief, modern, sophisticated and stylish. Quite a lot, though, has been achieved towards that end here. Certainly more changes than you'd expect to find in a mere facelift. The dash, centre tunnel and door panels are all completely different. The instruments have gone digital. And there's a much larger centre screen. As before, the aggressively stylized touches of the smaller Renegade are missing, the cabin instead, favouring a more mature, downscaled, grand Cherokee-style demeanour that Jeep thinks is more appropriate to the segment. At least the staple features we liked so much before are still in place, so the chunky three-spoke wheel feels great to hold, the driving position remains properly commanding, and the rubber floor mats and the chunky design of the various controls remind you that you're in a car from a brand that only makes SUVs. Even if you didn't know that production of the facelifted version of this model has been transferred from India to Italy, you'd probably agree with Jeep's stipulation that interior quality has taken a big step forward here. 
That's been required to justify the higher asking prices now necessary thanks to engine electrification, though you still wouldn't think you were in any kind of premium brand product. Lots of valiant design efforts gone in to try and achieve that kind of feel. This central stitched faux leather panel in the three-dimensional dashboard, for instance, not much of it seems especially cohesive and is let down a little by some questionable trimming choices. This fake stitching on the dash top, for instance, plus things like the lower quality plastics you get further down and the hollow sounding column stalks. It's a mixed bag with the new screen technology too. At first glance, it's all very glossy and quite impressive, but the 10.25 inch instrument cluster that you view through the chunky leather stitch steering wheel is on closer inspection, a rather complicated mess of different dials and digits. Everything you need is here, speed, gear selection, range, drive modes, time, temperature, and so on. But it's nowhere near as easy to assimilate as a more conventional layout would be. The kind of analog layout fitted to the original version of this model, for instance. Still, we've all got to adjust to new technology and here a button on the wheel allows you to flip through a series of tiles, Jeep calls them pages, that prioritise what you see in the middle of the display. There's driving data, drive assistance or audio info options, but for the electrified models, you'll probably want to focus on the various hybrid readouts for range or the combination of charge and power being used. Anything else you might need here lies on this 10.1 inch Uconnect 5 centre screen, which is 1.7 inches larger than the pre-facelift model's largest monitor, offers over-the-air updates and uses a processor with response times five times faster. Shortcut buttons run along the bottom edge of this display for things like media, the wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto phone connectivity and various apps. Plus, there's a TomTom navigation system if you avoid the two most affordable trim levels. There's also a useful vehicle section that on the hybrid models has a power flow meter and lots of complicated looking efficiency data screens. Plus a very sophisticated looking climate section too, though thankfully Jeep has also provided physical buttons for that lower down the center stack. With a subscription, you can add in a 4G Wi-Fi hotspot and build on the Uconnect voice control setup by using the integrated Amazon Alexa setups Alexa voice service. This can do everything from searching for a nearby restaurant to adjusting the lights or heating for your home automation system. Not everything's ideal about this monitor though. For a start, Jeep hasn't bothered to change its positioning to suit our right-hand drive market. So instead of being angled towards the driver, it's actually slightly angled away from you. And the various display menus have too many small icons that are difficult to accurately hit on the move. Usually in modern cars, screen technology is there to inhale quite a few of the dashboard functions previously accounted for by knobs and buttons, but there's little sign of that here. Physical switch gear still liberally litters the fascia, steering wheel and centre console, which you wouldn't have an issue with if the placement was a little less haphazard. Audio system dials jostle for position with climate controls and it's easy to activate the screen off button when all you wanted to do was cool the cabin or open the fuel filler lid when reaching for the hybrid buttons. What is good is that Jeep has taken steps to improve cabin storage, a notable failing of this car in its original form. There's now three times as much stowage space, 7.2 litres of it, the increase mainly down to this redesigned centre console, which includes a deep lidded bin between the seats with cup holders just in front. You also get a big glove box, decent door pockets with bottle holders and this useful area at the base of the centre stack with a 15 watt smartphone charger. Connectivity ports sit just above, which we were pleased to see accommodate USB-A as well as USB-C plugs. So there's no need for the unsightly converter leads that customers often have to fit to German branded products these days. There's no overhead compartment for your sunglasses, but you do get ticket clips in the sun visors as well as coin recesses in the doors. What else might you need to know? Well, head, shoulder and legroom here at the front are all quite generous by class standards and plenty of seat and wheel adjustment makes it easy for drivers of all shapes and sizes to quickly get comfortable. Plus, the high set seating position referenced earlier means great forward visibility. 
Thanks to the stylized rear C pillar, though, your rear three-quarter view isn't so great, hence the need for a standard rear view camera to complement the rear sensors fitted across the range. Time to move back to the rear. Now, the Compass is 150 millimetres longer than Jeep's smaller Renegade model, and that used to be enough to make it a little bigger than the Qashqai segment norm. These days, though, newer designs have overtaken it. The more recent Qashqai design, for instance, is 30 millimetres longer. Can this Jeep still be seen as class competitive in terms of space for rear-seated folk? Let's find out. Well, Jeep's problem here is not only that class rivals like that Nissan have got bigger, but also that this Compass model's push for engine electrification has meant higher pricing that now positions this car against much bigger mid-sized SUV models, cars like Ford's Cougar, Mazda's CX-5 and Volkswagen's Tiguan. Even something more affordable, like a Skoda Karok, feels far more spacious than this at the back and includes the sliding reclining rear bench that this Jeep's also lacks. Still, the target market here doesn't tend to take tape measures on test drives, and for many Compass customers, it'll simply be enough that this car is a far more credible option for a family than a Jeep Renegade would be. Back here, it helps that, rather surprisingly, for a design that must incorporate a capable four-wheel drive system on some of its variants, the central transmission tunnel is low and knee rooms better than we expected. So, if you had to fit three adults back here, it'd probably feel a bit easier to do than would be the case with some apparently larger class rivals. You get the usual coat hooks in the grab handles and there's plenty of storage space too. Decent door bins, cup holders in this centre armrest, coin recesses in the doors and seat back pockets. And not only does Jeep provide connectivity ports back here below these centre vents, but they're also of both the USB-A and USB-C kind. Hardly any other car on the market offers that. Headroom's fine unless you pay more to get yourself the big optional command view panoramic sunroof which you don't really need to lighten the atmosphere because despite these kicked up side windows, it's quite a glassy cabin, aided by these little rear quarter lights. Let's finish with a look in the boot. Now, unless you stretch to the very summit of the range, there's no power operation for this tailgate, which is a pity because it's quite heavy. Once it's raised, you'll find 438 litres of space, a big improvement on the 351 litre capacity of a Renegade, but not very competitive within the Compass's chosen segment. A Nissan Qashqai offers 480 litres, a Seat Attica 510 litres, and quite a few other class contenders have even more than that. On the positive side, the usual significant reduction in cargo capacity that afflicts the plug-in hybrid versions of most models in this class doesn't materialise here because Jeep has been successful in hiding all the electrical components away beneath floor level. So, the capacity of this Compass 4xE, 420 litres, is only 18 litres less than the conventional model. Part of the reason why that total capacity figure isn't as high as it should be lies with the way these prominent wheel arches encroach into cargo area space. But that's down to the car's extra wheel articulation, which you'd be glad of off-road. We appreciate the provision of an adjustable height boot floor, but not the fact that it's impossible to use the thing if, as would be wise, you specify a spare wheel to sit below the cargo base. Only the top Trailhawk variant gets that spare wheel as standard. Having an extra wheel in place means there's nowhere on this PHEV model to accommodate the charging cable either. And on all models, there's quite a loading lip to lug your stuff over. Dim lights are provided on either side of the loading area. There are the usual four tie-down points. And Jeep hasn't forgotten to include a 12-volt socket. Disappointingly, though, Virtually all models do without a properly segmented rear bench, unless you stretch right to the very top of the range, where there's a 40-20-40 split rear bench. There's only the basic 60-40 split that features here. Because you can't have a ski hatch either, it means that long items like skis can't be slid in between a couple of rear-seated passengers. So if the back seat's filled, items like that will have to go on the roof. 
Fold everything flat and up to 1,251 litres of space is revealed, which should be just about sufficient for the needs of most family folk. Though rather curiously, that's 46 litres less than you'd get in a Renegade. Lower spec Compass variants come with a useful fold flat front passenger seat that would enable you to take really long items. As we've been saying elsewhere in this film, there are now three levels of Jeep Compass ownership. None of them offer diesel power and none of the affordable models feature four-wheel drive. Yes, you heard that right. Front-wheel drive predominates on a Jeep. We'll guide you through the pricing current at the time of our test in spring 2022. The most affordable rung on the ladder lies with the conventional 1.3-litre variants, which use a 1.3-litre petrol unit featuring no hybridisation whatsoever and putting out 129 bhp through the front wheels. Prices start at a fraction under £30,000 for the base Knight Eagle version, or you can pay £1,000 more and get plusher limited trim. Think in terms of a premium of around £5,000 over what you'd pay to get the same engine in a similarly specified version of the brand's smaller Renegade model. Jeep hopes, though, that you'll be more likely to consider one of the electrified models, most probably one of the e-hybrid variants, which require a £3,000 premium over the base engine. You don't get any more power with the 1.5-litre e-hybrid petrol unit, nor can the car offer four-wheel drive with this power plant. But opting for it does give you a seven-speed dual-clutch auto transmission and, of course, a great deal more efficiency. There's a wider choice of trim options too. Not only Night Eagle from around £33,000 and Limited from around £34,000, but also Eco Conscious Upland from around £36,000 and Plush Top Spec from around £37,000. If you're prepared to countenance an even greater outlay on your compass, then you might want to consider the 4xe plug-in hybrid version we've chosen to try here, the only four-wheel drive model in the range. This PHEV derivative has a 178 bhp version of the base model's 1.3-litre engine, allied to an electric motor on the rear axle, creating a four-wheel drive model with a six-speed auto gearbox and a total output of 237 bhp. The brand offers the 4xe derivative in three guises. There's the off-road style Trailhawk version we have here, priced at around £40,000, an eco-conscious upland model, which costs the same, or a 4xe variant with top S trim, priced at around £41,000. OK, so that's briefed you on the Compass lineup. How does its value proposition compare against rivals in this segment? Well, we'll concentrate on volume brand models here. Obviously, the premium brand makers also make SUVs of this size with similar technology, but these, of course, will cost quite a lot more in comparably specified form and tend to appeal to a slightly different kind of customer. In its most affordable forms, this Jeep can't really claim to be much tougher and SUV capable than other mainstream C-segment family SUVs. So it needs to stand head to head with them on value if it's to fight its corner in this crowded market. With that in mind, you might think that the range starting price, as we said, now up around £30,000, is a little high for a Qashqai class crossover. But bear in mind that Jeep isn't bothering with the poverty spec trim levels you'll find offered by other brands in this class. Hardly any Nissan Qashqais are sold at under the £27,000 mark, and most are sold at around £29,000 to £30,000 with similar power plants to the 1.3-litre entry-level unit that features here. The same is true of that Nissan's similarly engineered close cousin, the Renault Austral, and of the car that both these models target most directly, the Seat Attica, whose engineering is shared in this class by the Skoda Karok and the Volkswagen Tiguan, both also quite similarly priced. 
This second generation compass design predates the period in which Jeep became part of the Stellantis group. So it doesn't share its engineering with the three other Stellantis models in this segment. The Peugeot 3008, the Citroen C5 Aircross and the Vauxhall Grandland. You'd save a little by choosing the Grandland, but not that much by the time you equalised equipment levels with the Jeep. And if you did that with the C5 Aircross and the 3008, the sticker figures might be roughly comparable to those of a Compass. It's also worth pointing out that the rise in Compass pricing, necessary to reflect its newfound electrification strategy, has put it on a par with slightly larger mid-sized models in this segment. Cars like Mazda's CX-5 and Ford's Cougar, which also tend to cost from around £30,000. And the pricing of the Compass e-hybrid models is much the same as you'd pay for slightly larger and much more efficient, proper, self-charging full hybrid contenders in this class, like Honda's CR-V hybrid, Toyota's RAV4, and full hybrid HEV versions of the Hyundai Tucson and the Kia Sportage. Food for thought. If you're looking at the Compass 4xe plug-in hybrid variant we're trying here, then bear in mind that the £40,000 price point required is pretty typical for a PHEV C-segment model of this kind. It's certainly pretty much what you'd pay for comparably specified plug-in versions of the Hyundai Tucson and the Kia Sportage. PHEV models in this class costing significantly less, like plug-in versions of the Ford Cougar, the Vauxhall Grandland, the Citroen C5 Aircross, the Volkswagen Tiguan and the MGHS, for example, are cheaper because they only come in front-driven form. Or, in the case of the Mini Countryman PHEV, cheaper because they're slightly smaller. Either way, make sure you're comparing like with like. Four-wheel drive plug-in rivals like Peugeot's 3008 Hybrid 4, Toyota's RAV4 plug-in and the Suzuki A-Cross all cost several thousand more than Jeep will charge for a Compass 4xe, even a very well-specified one. And predictably, there's absolutely nothing in the class at any price with the off-road prowess of the Compass 4xe Trailhawk model we're trying here. If, having considered all of that, you conclude that there really is nothing quite like a Compass in this class, you're going to need to know just how generous the brand's been with the standard spec. Time for the detail on that. Even the entry-level Night Eagle model comes with 18-inch alloy wheels, LED smart beam reflector headlights with auto high beam, LED tail lamps, solar control glass, power folding mirrors, rain-sensitive wipers, roof rails and an alarm. Inside, you get a 10.25-inch instrument cluster screen, dual-zone climate control, heat for the front seats and steering wheel, all-weather branded floor mats, and powered lumbar adjustment for the front seats. Plus, the front passenger seat folds flat for really long loads. Drive stuff includes an active speed-limiting device, cruise control, trailer sway damping, a rear-view camera and rear parking sensors, plus a package of camera safety kit we'll get to shortly. Media provision across the range comes courtesy of a 10.1-inch Uconnect 5 central screen, which includes wireless Apple CarPlay or Android Auto phone connectivity, a six-speaker DAB audio system and various apps. With a subscription, you can add in a 4G Wi-Fi hotspot and build on the Uconnect voice control setup by using the integrated Amazon Alexa setup's Alexa voice service. This can do everything from searching for a nearby restaurant to adjusting the lights or heating for your home automation system. Compass customers can also download the My Uconnect mobile app so that they can remotely interact with their car when in it and out of it. Using the My Remote part of the app, owners can lock or unlock the doors, turn lights on, program the air conditioning system, set driving alerts based on speed or vehicle position, and get directions to their vehicle if they've forgotten where they've parked it. The My Car section of the app checks your vehicle's condition and verifies tyre pressures, mileage and the servicing schedule. 
My assistant connects the customer with an operator to request roadside assistance in the event of a breakdown. Plus, there's call center support for technical issues. And using the My Navigation section, customers can send a destination to the vehicle's navigational system, then find a route and check traffic conditions, weather and speed camera locations along the way. For a 4xe compass variant like this one, the My Uconnect app can do even more. The My Car section allows you to check battery level from wherever you are, while the My Navigation section allows you to view charging stations located near the car, highlighting points on the map that can be reached based on the vehicle's current level of battery charge. And the My Remote section allows you to schedule vehicle charging for a convenient time slot. There's also a My eCharge section, which manages all charging sessions and allows you to book and pay for them on the app. If you've decided on a compass but want to treat yourself to something a bit nicer than Knight Eagle level trim, then you'll want to look at paying the extra for a mid-range limited model. Here you get smarter diamond cut 18 inch wheels, a signature beam for the LED reflector headlamps, chrome exterior accents and front and side parking sensors with an automatic parking function. Inside, limited models gain a Nappa leather wrapped dashboard, a wireless charging mat, an auto dimming rear view mirror and adaptive cruise control. If you've chosen the e-hybrid or the 4xe models, want a more distinctive look with extra equipment and like the idea of emphasising your eco credentials, then Jeep will offer you the Upland trim level, which has a slightly more distinctive look. There's an exclusive matte azure green exterior colour with a two-tone black roof, a dedicated bonnet sticker and metachrome bronze finishes on the front grille rings. Inside, the Upland trim level features extensive use of recycled materials, which feature on the headliner, the floor mats and the sequel upholstery, which is fashioned from recycled plastic removed from the Mediterranean Ocean and presented with distinctive contrast branded stitching on the front backrests. Plus, TomTom -tom navigation is added to the central Uconnect 5 screen. Upland trim also gets you Jeep's Highway Assist Level 2 Autonomous Driving System for highway travel. More about that in a moment. The top of the range trim level is branded S. With this, you get 19-inch gloss black alloy wheels, a body-coloured front bumper, deep-tinted sunscreen glass and a power tailgate. Inside, with an S-spec model, as well as navigation, there's front seats that can be electrically adjusted to eight different positions, plus a more convenient 40-20-40 split rear bench seat. That only leaves the off-road orientated Trailhawk trim level we're trying here, which, as mentioned earlier, you can only have if you opt for the 4xe plug-in hybrid version. The Trailhawk badge designates the fact that this car comes with what Jeep calls trail-rated 4x4 capability, which is delivered here courtesy of high-performance suspension and improved off-road angles. Standard on the Trailhawk is also the five-mode Select Terrain Traction Control System, which includes a range of drive modes, sand and mud, snow, sport, auto, and a Trailhawk-specific rock setting. Plus, you get underbody skid plates, special off-road orientated 17-inch alloy wheels, hill descent control, and a full-sized spare wheel. On to options. Now, Let's start with the various packs that your dealer will want you to consider. Most customers choosing the base Night Eagle trim level will want to consider the extra cost full tech pack, which for just over £1,500 more gives you navigation, adaptive cruise control, a wireless charging mat, LED front fog lamps, traffic sign information and an auto dimming rear view mirror. If you're looking at the mid-range limited model, your dealer will offer you the Infotainment Plus pack, which for £1,100 more gives you a powered tailgate with hands-free access, plus navigation and traffic sign information. 
If your focus is on the eco-branded Upland trim level, you'll be offered the option of a premium pack, which for £1,600 gives you the powered tailgate and a dual-pane sunroof. Meanwhile, with Top S trim, there are two available options, both costing £1,250 more. One, the ventilated leather seat pack, gives you leather upholstery with cooled front ventilation, memory functions for the driver's seat and full power adjustment for the front passenger seat. The the other pack is the Technology and Convenience Pack, which gives you an Alpine premium audio system, a 360-degree camera setup, a 230-volt auxiliary power outlet, and a park and exit parallel and perpendicular park assist system that steers you into spaces. On an S model, you can add the dual-pane sunroof too. That only leaves us this rather unique Trailhawk model. Here we've had fitted that technology and convenience pack that was just mentioned, which here also adds a blind spot and cross path detection system. Trailhawk customers can also add a premium pack for £1,600 more, which includes the dual pane sunroof and the powered tailgate. And they might additionally want to consider a more expensive Trailhawk branded version of that ventilated leather seat pack we just mentioned which also throws in the more versatile 40-20-40 split rear bench seat. Beyond these various optional packs, your Jeep dealer will offer you a whole range of Mopar authentic accessories with which to customise your compass or add to its practicality. Some of them are features that add an extra touch of aesthetic flair, like the matte black and Pantone blue border hood decal for the bonnet that we have here. Plus, there are mirror cover decals and unique front grille rings. The Mopar range also offers door sill embellishments, black rock rail guards for the lower side sills and side window air deflectors. For the boots, you can order a rubber molded cargo tray, a premium carpet cargo mat, a cargo net, a cargo bay organiser with telescopic arms, floor rails to which you can attach an elasticated strap and a special cargo tote bag. And, as you'd expect from a modern, lifestyle-orientated car, once you've fitted the optional roof rails, you can start to consider the wide selection of roof boxes and racks designed for transporting winter and water sports equipment such as bikes, surfboards, skis and snowboards. Add the optional tow bar, and there are various carrier systems that mount on that too. Bear in mind, before you go too far with any of this, that you'll probably be paying extra for your chosen paint colour. The only standard shade is solid black. Pay £700 more and your choice will widen to include three other solid colours, blue, white or, as in this case, Colorado red, plus a couple of metallic shades. For £1,100 over the base cost of your compass, these extra cost shades get thrown in with a contrast coloured black roof. On to safety. Now, we noted back in 2018 at the original launch of this second generation Compass that the bar had certainly been raised in this respect. But then this model's awful predecessor ugh, could hardly have been worse. It received a miserable two star rating from the experts at Euro NCAP. And that was with the older, less stringent test being used back then. It was very different when this Mark II model arrived, Jeep referencing a range of over 70 available active and passive safety and security features. As a result, at its original launch, this present generation design received a full house five-star rating from Euro NCAP, with adult protection rated at 90% and child protection at 83%. This impressive showing came thanks primarily to a couple of things. First, the much stronger body. This compass boasts a safety cage construction with more than 65% high strength steel. And second, the standard provision across the range of an automatic emergency braking system as standard. Jeep calls its system forward collision warning plus mitigation. As usual, with these kinds of setups, this one scans the road ahead as you drive for potential accident hazards. If one is detected, you'll be warned, and if you don't respond or aren't able to, then the car will automatically brake itself, decreasing the severity of any resulting accident. Lane departure warning, Jeep calls it active lane management, 
also comes included to proactively warn you if you drift over lane delineating lines on the highway. As does a drowsy driver alert system that'll note driver drowsiness and prompt a stop for a restorative coffee. With a more affordable Night Eagle and limited trim levels, you can pay extra to add traffic sign assist too. All models also get the expected passive safety features, of course. Things like ISOFIX child seat fastenings, tyre pressure monitoring, an energy absorbing steering column, hill start assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions, and twin front side and curtain airbags. The car's Uconnect 5 system also has a built in e call system that will alert the rescue services with your exact GPS location if any of those airbags inflate in an accident. To try and make sure the airbags won't be needed, there's plenty of electronic assistance, ESC stability control and electronic roll mitigation, of course, plus all speed traction control and a brake traction control system to offer extra grip on start off or through the bends. The ABS braking system features panic brake assist and ready alert braking to quicken emergency stops. There's a DST, or Driving Steering Torque system, to counter scary oversteer on low grip surfaces. And trailer sway control will come in useful too, if you'll be fitting a tow bar and doing some towing. If you want more and you're looking at this 4xe Trailhawk variant, then, as mentioned earlier, you can consider the optional technology and convenience pack, which gives you Jeep's blind spot and cross path detection system. This gives you a blind spot alert system that warns you if you're about to dangerously pull out to overtake another car. And a rear cross path detection system that will alert you to oncoming traffic when you're reversing out of a parking bay. Finally, let's consider autonomous driving, something this improved Compass can now offer in its pricier upland form. This comes courtesy of Jeep's Highway Assist system, which offers so-called Level 2 autonomous driving, using a combination of adaptive cruise control and lane centering to automatically adjust speed and trajectory when driving on highways. One of the major issues with lifestyle oriented Jeep models in the past has been running cost efficiency. Owners have always been quite happy to forgive a sub-par frugality showing on models with almost unrivalled off-road prowess. You never see anyone complaining about the fuel figures of a Wrangler, for instance. Quite rightly though, they see no reason why more lifestyle oriented models with Fiat underpinnings should be granted an equally easy efficiency pass. And that, to quite a large extent, explained the relatively mediocre sales figures of this second generation Compass in its original form. Hence all the electrification effort expended upon this model update. As we've said elsewhere in this film, Jeep wants the majority of Compass customers to consider its latest e-hybrid technology. And in our driving section, we briefed you on lots of its impressive sounding e-feature elements. Ultimately, it's a kind of compromise between the kind of mainstream engines competitors offer either mild hybrid units that don't deliver much efficiency benefit or self-charging full hybrid power plants that do but cost a lot more. Sure enough, the tax determining CO2 emissions stat of a Compass e-hybrid up to 139 grams per kilometre of CO2 sits plumb between these two approaches. For comparison, a mild hybrid Nissan Qashqai DIGT 140 manages 143 grams per kilometre, while a full hybrid Toyota RAV4 returns 126 grams per kilometre. Dig a bit deeper though, and the readings don't look so good from Jeep's point of view. Its hybrid tech may be supposedly more sophisticated than what you'd get in a mild hybrid engine, but the combined fuel figures lag well behind what you get from typical mild hybrid rivals. A Compass e-hybrid returns a combined reading of 36.3 mpg. For a mild hybrid Nissan Qashqai, Kia Sportage or Hyundai Tucson in this class, the return is closer to the 45 mpg mark. And of course, it's way off what you'd get from the kind of self-charging full hybrid model 
in this segment that you could have for the kind of money Jeep wants for an e-hybrid compass. That Toyota RAV4, for instance, manages just over 50 mpg on the combined cycle. If you really like the idea of a compass, of course, this may not matter much, but we can't help thinking that if that's the case, you might be better off saving the £3,000 premium the brand wants for its e-hybrid tech and opting instead for the base 1.3-litre conventional engine in this model. After all, though the CO2 return of that entry-level variant is quite a lot worse, 159 grams per kilometre, its combined fuel reading of 42.8 mpg is actually a lot better, aided by a lighter curb weight and the use of a manual gearbox rather than an automatic. In an ideal world, of course, as a Compass customer, you'd sidetrack this decision altogether and find the rather substantial extra fee that Jeep wants for the 4xe plug-in hybrid model we're trying here. Again, we briefed you on the workings of the PHEV system in our driving section. What you need to know here is whether it works in terms of frugality. Obviously, as with any plug-in hybrid, you'll get nowhere near the quoted combined cycle fuel return, here rated at between 141.2 and 156.9 mpg, but our test readings suggest that if you plug in regularly, you'll get somewhere near the kind of 50 mpg economy you might have expected to get on a good day from the old 2-litre multi-jet diesel model. And maybe, if quite a lot of your suburban driving's done in heavy traffic, you'll actually do a bit better. Obviously, if you don't plug in your Compass 4xe and get the benefit of the claimed 30-mile battery range before the engine cuts in, more like 20 to 25 miles in the real world, all you'll be doing is trolling around in a heavy petrol-powered Jeep, which of course won't be very efficient at all. What you can benefit from, however, is the quoted CO2 figure, 44 grams per kilometre, which means a benefiting kind rating of 14%. That's way better, of course than you get from the conventional models. The Compass e-hybrid is rated up at 32%, but it's actually not especially good by segment standards. Plug-in versions of similarly priced Kia Sportage and Hyundai Tucson models are cleaner and go slightly further on battery charge, hence an 11% BIK rating. Pricier Toyota RAV4 and Suzuki A-Cross plug-in models do even better and consequently reduce HMRC's pound of flesh to just 8%. Perhaps more serious than statistical semantics is the question of combined overall engine and battery driving range. The right-hand side of the digital instrument screen breaks this down for you and it quickly becomes clear that, influenced perhaps by the heavier weight of this compass compared to more lifestyle orientated rivals, the distance you can travel between stops for fossil fuel replenishment isn't very great you'll probably be doing well to get much more than around 200 to 225 miles from the 8.1 gallon fuel tank, which means that once you add on all the electric driving mileage, your ultimate range between fuel stops may well be significantly below the 300 mile mark. Plenty of full electric SUVs of this size can better that. Real world efficiency in this Compass 4xe will of course be influenced primarily by the way you drive, and the proactiveness of your use of the system drive mode buttons here on the centre stack, hybrid, electric and e-save. It'll help that lots of efficiency tools are provided in the e-hybrid section of the centre screen. A neat power flow screen shows you battery or engine use in real time and kilowatt usage from battery, engine and climate control. A driving history section has two very detailed, perhaps rather over-detailed sections. Distance travelled, which shows you the miles driven in battery and engine modes. And regeneration history, which gives you your journey's kilowatt hour gains through coasting and braking. You can also use the e-hybrid section to set charging times using a typical 7 kilowatt home wall box. That'll take just under three hours and you can vary the charging battery level. More drive tools feature on the instrument screen, primarily two gauges, one for braking and acceleration, the other for your combination of charge and power. 
What else? Well, like all Jeeps, this one comes with the benefits of the Jeep Wave Loyalty Programme. This gives you three years of complimentary servicing and roadside assistance. Across the range, garage visits, by the way, are required every year or every 9,000 miles, whichever comes first. Compass owners also get a dedicated Jeep customer care service where a team of expertly trained agents will be available 24-7 to answer any questions about your journey. On to residual values, which should be OK. Industry experts CAP reckon that after three years and 36,000 miles, a Compass S 4xE will retain 44.6% of its original value. And finally, let's take a look at insurance groups. The base 1.3 litre model is rated at Group 17E, the 1.5 litre e-hybrid rates at Group 18E, and the 4xE is 29E. In its earlier form, the Compass was a marginal player in the mid-sized SUV sector, and we can't see that changing anytime soon. But it's a much better product than it used to be, and the addition of e-hybrid and PHEV tech to the range brings it into line with the way the segment is developing. You get the impression that customers in the mid-sized SUV market want Jeep to succeed. They may not have bought its cars in the recent past, but they'd like to have been able to credibly consider them. Now they can once more. This Compass may not be as polished a proposition as some of its segment rivals, but unlike its predecessors, it's now a tough and tempting way to buy into this macho mark. The magazines will tell you that there are better cars in this segment, and there are certainly more efficient hybrids and PHEVs. But none of the contenders concerned, though, feel as much of an authentic SUV as this Compass does. To get this, you have to make a few small compromises in terms of refinement and tarmac drive dynamics. Whether you're prepared to do that will depend on the kind of buyer you are. If all you really want is a jacked-up family hatch, go ahead and buy a Qashqai or an Attica. They're very good cars, but arguably they're not very good SUVs. It all comes down to whether you think the difference is important. What's at stake, then, is the definition of what a car of this kind should be. Jeep reckons that the design of a model in this segment should be more than just about plastic skid plates and raised suspension. It always has. The difference here, though, is that the company has, at last, made a car that credibly represents that philosophy in the affordable mid-size section of the mainstream market. In future, the company will build better SUVs than this, but there's no doubt that what's on offer here represents a decent step forward for the brand. When testing the smaller Renegade, we pointed out that if you eat squirrel, own a bowling ball and call your first cousin your spouse, then that model probably wouldn't be your cup of tea. And the same, of course, applies here. Yes, the four-wheel drive plug-in version of this Compass offers more off-road prowess than you'd typically get from a car in this class, especially in this more rugged-looking trailhawk form. But this still isn't in any way a Jeep for the wilds. Still, likely owners won't want Wrangler motoring. They'll be after the more zeitgeist-orientated lifestyle SUV vibe that this much-improved Compass is now better equipped to deliver, even in front-driven form. A Jeep, then, but not quite as we know it.